Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. The story of reggae music is well known and frequently discussed, but what is often overlooked is the story of a small but powerful group of influences from the Chinese Jamaican community. The likes of Tom Wong, Byron Lee, Vincent and Patricia Chin and Leslie Kong are an unsung backbone of studio engineers, musicians, producers, record store as well as record label owners that play the massive but uncelebrated role in the development of reggae and Jamaican music as we know it today. The origins of the Chinese Jamaican community dates back to the middle of the 19th century. After the abolition of slavery, a sizable number of Hakka Chinese emigrated to the island to work as indentured laborers. A century later, more than half of their population were Jamaican born and had cemented their role in society. Most of them owned businesses like grocery stores, petting parlors, ice cream shops and laundry services. But over time, many went on to collapse their businesses and invested in the music industry. It's only a handful of them that we're going to take a look at in this video, but let's go. Tom Wong Tom Wong was the founder of the island's first commercially successful sound system, which he established in 1950. He basically created the template that others would adopt and replicate. To get a proper grip on how big a deal this was, we need to take a look at the history of the sound system culture. Back in those days in Jamaica, not too many people in the inner cities and ghettos could afford record players in their homes. Those who could would often set up their gear outside so their neighbors could come around, listen and have a dance and a nice time. Eventually, some business savvy people found that they could sell drinks or food and invest the returns in better sound system equipment and this created what became an integral part of inner city culture. Indigenous genres of Jamaican music like ska and rocksteady were being ignored by the radio stations and could only be heard at these sound system events. Thus by the 1950s, sound systems were even more popular than live bands and radio. Tom Wong started the sound system by first investing in powerful amplifiers and assembling a professional crew of a selector, sound engineer and an MC. To keep the crowd energized, the MC or DJ in Jamaican parlance would have to toast. Toasting is essentially the art of speaking over instrumentals in a rhythm. Eventually, the crowds began to like the toasting even more than the songs themselves. Tom Wong had a DJ called Winston Cooper, aka Count Machuki, and he was one of the pioneers of toasting. His excellent wordplay and lyricism took toasting to a whole new level, winning lots of fans and disciples in the process. And one of his disciples was a young man called Ewart Beckford, who would come to be known as Uroy. Uroy was the first person to release a single entirely based on toasting in 1970 and created a subgenre of reggae music. Tom Wong cemented the sound system culture and inadvertently spawned dance hall. Byron Lee this visionary genius musician and producer invented Rocksteady, which evolved into reggae. In 1967, a Shanghai-born singer named Stephen Cheng came to Jamaica to record a song, which was a Taiwanese folk tune called Always Together. He teamed up with Byron Lee for the instrumentals, and the beats that Byron produced were an adaptation of ska and would become known as Rocksteady. Byron Lee also gets the credit for introducing the electric bass guitar to Jamaica. The musicians on the island only used to play the double bass, which Lee found bulky and difficult to move around from gig to gig. He would thus spark a musical revolution in Jamaica when he imported and started using the electric bass guitar, which was louder and clearer than the double bass and boosted off an in-your-face quality that was irresistible to listeners. And it was this bass guitar which was instrumental in launching the careers of reggae pioneers like Jimmy Cliff, Toots and the Metals and the Blues Busters. His band, Baron Lee and the Dragonaires, was one of the leading bands in Jamaica and they even made an appearance in the 1962 James Bond movie Dr. No, which was partly filmed in Jamaica. The band is also credited with unveiling and introducing future reggae legends like Dennis Brown, who began to perform with the band at the age of 9, and Marcia Griffiths, who started out as a backup singer with Baron Lee and the Dragonaires at the age of 15. Lee established Dynamic Studios in 1969 and it became the foremost recording facility in the entire Caribbean. It was the studio where an uncountable number of hits were created for the likes of Toots and the Metals, Eric Donaldson, Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley. Incidentally, it was the studio where Bob Marley went to record his first single titled One Cup of Coffee that was produced by the icon that is next on our list, Leslie Kong. 
Leslie Kong is celebrated for being the first Jamaican record producer to craft international hit songs. He produced groundbreaking tunes for Bob Marley, Peter Tosh, Jimmy Cliff, Toots and the Metals, and Desmond Decker. In fact, reggae got its name from a song that Kong produced for Toots and the Metals titled Do the Reggae in 1968. Kong entered into the music business in 1961. Up until then, he had been fully engaged in the family business, which was a restaurant that he ran with his brother called Beverly's. All that changed when late that year, he received a visit from a teenage boy who had traveled from his village all the way to Kingston in search of greener pastures. The boy wanted to write a song for the restaurant in exchange for some cash. Seeing the potential, that led Kong to launch his own record label, which he also named Beverly's, and led him to record the teenage boy's first single. That boy's name was James Chambers, but became known more popularly as Jimmy Cliff. Kong was also one of the original founders of Island Records before selling his share of the company to Chris Blackwell, the Who Kim Brothers. After the Jamaican government banned gambling on the island, four brothers divested from the family business, which was an ice cream parlor, liquor store, and a gambling house, which was situated just off Spanish Town Road, not too far from Trent Town. The eldest brother, Joseph, better known as Jojo, had always been intrigued by music and after a childhood friend of his, in popular singer John Holt, had asked him to accompany him to Byron Lee's Dynamic Sound Studios for a recording session, he decided to invest in the music business. By 1972, the Hukim brothers had set up the now legendary Channel One Studios and record label at 29 Maxfield Avenue in Kingston. They started with a basic four-track recorder, and by 1973, the hits had started rolling in with lots of ace producers like Lee Scratch Perry using the studio to record their music. By 1975, the studio had invested in an advanced 16-track recorder. This allowed sound engineers to produce more intricate music with a robust sound that the island had never heard before. Channel One Studios became an unstoppable force, cranking out a slew of hits from the mid-1970s, totally eclipsing established studios in Jamaica like Coxon Dodd Studio One, Duke Reed's Treasure Isle, and even Dynamic Studios that inspired them in the first place. Future legendary rhythm section Sly Dunbar and Robbie Shakespeare first came together and honed their craft as part of the studio's in-house backing band, aptly called The Revolutionaries. The studio also solidified the credibility of dance hall as legendary dance hall producer Henry John Joe Laws recorded the first tracks and albums of eventual reggae legends like Yellow Man and Barrington Levy. Let's not forget the studio and label's biggest stars, The Mighty Diamonds, whose debut album, Right Time, became just one of the greatest reggae albums of all time. Vincent and Patricia Chin In the late 1950s, a couple opened a record store called Randy's Record Mart. Vincent Chin had previously worked for a multi-millionaire hotel owner named Isaac Issa, stacking records into jukeboxes. He began to collect the old discarded records and eventually began to sell them out of his own store. This store would become the stepping stone to establishing the world's biggest reggae record label. By the early 1960s, many Jamaicans had moved abroad to form a populous and thriving Jamaican diaspora in the UK, the US and Canada. These folks abroad were homesick and longed for music from Jamaica. This stimulated a thriving record export market. The Chins sensed an opportunity beyond just selling records, and after moving their store to a new site, they converted part of it to a recording studio, and by 1968, their studio, named Studio 17, became just one of Jamaica's top recording outfits and recorded thousands of artists that included The Wailers, The Heptones, Dennis Brown, Gregory Isaacs, Burning Spear, and virtually all the top acts from the late 1960s down to the mid-1970s. The Chins moved to New York in 1977 and established a store on Jamaican Avenue in Queens. They made their move to harness the power of a fast-growing Jamaican community that was one of the most populous and vibrant Jamaican clusters outside of the island itself. They established VP Records, which would go on to act as an international distributor of reggae music, and this more than any other single factor became a launch pad for reggae music to go international, starting from the US. Today, as far as reggae is concerned, 9 out of 10 international superstars are VP Records affiliated. The Chinese Jamaican community has played and continues to play an amazing role in the establishment and movement of reggae music from a Jamaican-born art form to one of the greatest genres of music in the world today. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, 
subscribe and until next time, jobless.